November 2011. Uh, there's a mistake in the slides. Our players are Ivy League. It's not next Tuesday. It's the Tuesday after next. So it's on uh, 1st of November, 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, if you want to practice, there's a body task list and uh, pass Uh, okay, so uh, the task list and uh, past year exam papers are available on IVLE. So uh, today what we'll do is we'll begin if, uh, by looking at some of the scheme code we've seen so far in dealing with OOP, right? And then we'll see how we do the same thing in Java. So uh, like in recitations, we've seen uh, your food, your aged food, your vending machine. In lectures, you have seen the speaker, the lecture, the arrogant lecture. We'll see how to convert these into Java. And then we'll also go into some other concepts such as uh, how do you define variables in Java, how do you use conditionals like your if, else statements, and what arrays are. So, it's a data, so arrays are a data structure in Java. Uh, we'll look at that towards the end of this lecture. So uh, recall this. Uh, this. This should uh, look very uh, familiar to you by now. So we are creating a speaker here. Uh, let me see if there's a laser pointer. Okay, so it seems like I don't have one. So let me, let me just use the mouse instead. Okay, so um, here we have this lambda message. This is the body. Uh, we've seen this a million times. Uh, we check if message is say, and if it is, then we'll, we'll, we'll execute this method. And otherwise, you know, it'll just return that, you know, there's no such method. So it's, this should be very basic to you. So uh, how about this? This should also look very familiar. So here we're extending the speaker over here, and then we're adding a new method called lecture, where you take in another parameter called stuff, and you're you know, asking the speaker to say stuff, and also you should be taking notes. So this is what the lecturer does. And if there, and if there are no, the, the message that you pass into lecturer is not defined here, you'll just give it to the speaker. And then finally, you have your arrogant lecturer. So your, you know, your arrogant lecturer uh, extends lecturer, and he overwrites say now, so say was uh, defined previously in speaker, and you have lambda cells, uh, cells stuff, and then the lecturer says whatever you want him to say and appends his favorite phrase. So uh, this should look familiar to you. Uh, uh, when you're doing your missions, you, you're going to write code like this uh, a million times. But you know what's the observation here? The observation here really is that object-oriented programming in scheme is painful. Oops. It's very, very painful. And the reason for this is historical. I've already explained this in recitations. But the point is, um, Scheme does not have built-in support for objects, unlike uh, languages like Java and C++. The reason is Scheme really appeared first in 1935, and it was based in another language called Lisp. When do you think Lisp came out? So Scheme was in 1935. When do you think Lisp came out? 1958. So, so this was so long ago, and this was before you know, OOP was even standardized. OOP was standardized, I think, only in the early 80s, early 90s. So, you know, in Scheme, you do everything yourself. So, let's look at how to do this object in Java. This is how you define a speaker in Java. It's just five lines of code, and only three lines of code that have any real content. Compare this to this. There's so much crap here that you don't have it over there. So, like, you don't have this, uh, that's my mouse, there's no lambda message thing, there's no EQ message say you just define the method here called say, uh, there's no self, there just isn't any, and there's none of this no method nonsense. It's just much cleaner than doing this in, in Scheme. So let's look at the code in more detail. So the first thing you'll notice is this public thing over there. So like there's this public class speaker, and then there's this public void say. So this is what you call an access modifier. An access modifier uh, modifies how you will use the method in Java, or how you will access the 
how you use the class. So for instance, okay, so there are three kinds, right? I mean, there's public, private, and default. The point is, in a simple example like this, your method say here, I mean, your, your method say here is public, meaning anybody can call this method. Now suppose you're you know, doing a large software program and you have, say, hundreds of classes. And in some cases, you may want to have methods which, are not, which, are, which cannot be called by other classes. So to continue this example, suppose the speaker, right, he, he keeps talking, and suppose the speaker has a throat. I mean, we, we model that he has a throat here, and his throat, throat gets dry if he speaks too much. So if he speaks too much, what do you want him to do? You want him to drink water. But this has to be something the speaker does of his own volition, meaning after he speaks so much and he finds that his throat is dry, he will drink water. So we'll define a method called drink water. But that method should be a private method. Um, it should be a private method rather than a public method. Why? Because a speaker is the one who should control that he's supposed to drink water. Imagine that it's a public method instead. So imagine like Ben is a class, he's in front of you talking to you, and you keep sending him the message, drink water, drink water, and drink water. <laughs> so what happens is he's going to drink enough water to kill himself. And you don't want that. Because if you do that, then I'll be stuck teaching you for everything else. And you don't want that either. So, so those are access modifiers. Uh, there are a lot of details to this, but a lot of it you'll learn in uh, the next semester. The next thing you'll notice is this white thing over here. So in, in Scheme, when you define functions, all your function return something. It either return, let's say, a value, a lambda, something. But in Java, you could define messages that don't actually return anything. So in this case, like speaker, when you ask him to say something, he just prints it out to the screen. There is no actual, there's no real return value. You are not returning any integer. You're not returning any string. So you say the return type is void, meaning you are not going to return anything. And finally, uh, uh, not finally, but there's this other thing called, OK, so this is a method, right? Public void, say. But all methods in Java must belong to a class. So a class, so, so this is a class, so here you're defining your speaker class, your speaker object. So you would have separate classes for your lecturer, your arrogant lecturer, uh, your food, aged food vending machine. And all methods must belong within a class. They don't exist outside. Okay, and then you also need to declare your types for your parameters. So this is a method. This, okay, this is an access modifier, the return type, the name of the method, and you include all your parameters over here. So here you're saying that the parameter stuff will be a string. It won't be an integer. It will not be a decimal value. It will not be, say, a true or false value. It will be a string. And you have to do this because Java is uh, statically and strongly typed, meaning you always have to declare what kind of types your variables are. OK, so that was uh, pretty basic. So let's look at lecturer. Now compare this to this. So again, I mean, there's a lot of things you could notice. You, you, okay, so the first thing is, notice here that when you're extending the speaker class, the lecturer, you have to you know, keep track of the state separately. But in Java, you just use extend speaker. You're not, you don't actually have to explicitly keep track of the speaker somewhere. Then also notice that when you are in that, so you created a method here to lecture. And then you just call say. But in, in the scheme version, you had to ask the speaker to say. But Java is smart enough. You just have to say, you just use the method name directly, just for the method. And it will check if the method is in the lecturer class. And if it isn't, it will go into the super class. You do not actually have to say ask, speaker, say, whatever. Just call say. So there's no need to specifically create an instance of a superclass. You just use extends, and you don't have to ask the superclass to say anything. Just say it. So these are all synthetic sugars. So uh, the point is, by not, doing, by, by not doing this explicitly, it doesn't mean that Java doesn't keep track of these things. It actually does. It's just that you do not have to do it manually yourself. Java does everything automatically for you. So it's synthetic sugar. So this is your arrogant lecturer. So again, you're extending your lecturer. And so let's, let's look at the structure of the code. You already know what the scheme code looks like. It looks horrible. So 
this is your internal state. So here you want to keep track of the favorite phrase of the arrogant lecturer. So this is, so here you're declaring a variable. You're not declaring a method. So it's a string. It's the lecturer's favorite phrase. And the modifier is private. And then, OK, so that's the internal state. And this is your constructor. So note, uh, so recall that in recitations, when we define the food class or the vending machine, we've always been defining make food, make aged food. Uh, it's always make then the object name. But in Java, you don't actually have to do that. You declare this thing known as a constructor. So it's a special method with the public modifier, no return type, and the name of the method is the same as the class name. Okay, and then you put in whatever parameters that you want to. So. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we actually construct new objects later like this, but this is how you create a constructor. And finally, over here, you're overriding say. So you're doing public void say, uh, the message, and you're overriding the say that is defined in speaker. Uh, question is, does anyone know what this is? This add override thing over here. Yeah, it's a special tag. So, this, okay, oops. This isn't actual Java code. It's known as, okay, it's called a Java annotation, and it's not part of the code. You do not actually have to write this. The reason you write this is because you want to signal your intention to Java that you want to override the same method. And why is this helpful? Well, suppose you're working, again, you're working on a large project, and you're using these classes. And let's say at some day, you go to your speaker class, and you delete the same method. So now you're say, I mean, there is no say in the speaker class anymore. And then you come back to the arrogant lecturer, and the, the then Java will complain, look, you, you said that you wanted to override the say method, but there is no say method to override anymore. So what exactly is it that you're overriding? So it will give you an error. So it's to help you uh, write bug-free bug code. And another thing is, this is optional. You do not have to include it in this same line. You could always uh, write public void say in a separate line and put the annotation just above. If you are a bit confused about this, just don't use it. Uh, it's not needed for your exams. OK, so now let's look at the content of each method. So over here, notice that there's something called shadowing happening in place. So the thing is, here you have a variable called favorite phrase. OK, so that's the state of this object. And then you have a constructor. And your constructor has a parameter named favorite phrase. So these two names are exactly the same. And what you want to do is you want to say, look, I want to set this value to the value given in this parameter. And to do that, you can't write favorite phrase equals to favorite phrase. Because that doesn't do anything. That's like doing set bang AA. I mean, there's no, there's no change. So what you use is this, the keyword known as this. So what this, uh, oops, sorry, what this does is it references the, the, the arrogant lecture itself accesses the variable, this, this, this state variable, and says set this to the value given by this. So that's why you're doing this dot favorite phrase equals the favorite phrase. To avoid using this, you could that you if you want to avoid using this, you have to change the names of either this or this so that they are not the same. So you could call this favorite phrase one and favorite phrase two, and then just do favorite phrase one equals to favorite phrase two. And then you have this. So so that and then now you have this. So look at what this method does. You do super dot say equals blah blah blah. So notice that we are overriding the speaker class, right? And if you look at the, uh, the, the arrogant lecturer in scheme over here, we are asking the lecturer to say stuff. The arrogant lecturer extends lecturer, and you are asking the lecturer to say stuff. You're overriding say here, and you're asking the lecturer to say stuff. And in Java, you, are also, uh, you also want to ask the lecturer to say something. But the way to do it would be to say super dot say. So, oops, what that does is it says take the say method from the super class and call that one instead. So, what happens if you don't have the super? What happens if you just 
if you just eliminate this and just put same message, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it will go in the infinite recursion because when you just do say, it's just going to call this, this method again, and then that will just call itself again and again and again, and it will just infinitely recurse and crash the program. So you use the keyword called super. Super means the super class, whatever it is that you're extending. And the dot notation that you've been using all along says invoke. So, so if you want to call a method in a class, you use the dot method. I mean, so if you have an object, so like an object A, and you want to call a method foo on that object A, so you do A dot foo. It's similar to ask. So instead of doing ask foo A, just, you know, ask A foo, you just do A dot foo. So we've seen all these codes. So how do you ex exactly run it? Well, scheme is interpreted. So you just type all your scheme code in Dr. Racket, and you run it, and y you hope it works. But Java is compiled. So what happens is all your objects are defined in Java files, in its own files. So your speaker will be in a speaker class, uh, speaker.java. Your arrogant lecturer will be in arrogant lecturer.java and so on. And then you use a compiler known as Java C. So this is the name of the compiler. You compile it into a uh, uh, machine representation of the code to speaker.class. So this machine representation is not like what, it's not the source code you write. It's a form which is simpler for the machine to execute. And then, finally, you could run the class file with the Java virtual machine. So, okay, so these slides are written by Ben, right? So he says these steps are complicated, okay? But uh, let's see, okay, so we are 20 minutes into the lecture, so I think we have enough, enough time for me to tell you about a dirty secret in life. A dirty secret. No, this thing, right, this, this, this is a crime uh, which I, totally and absolutely hate, but everyone does it, including me. So you can see, you can you know, understand how annoyed I am with myself sometimes. The point is, right, take a sufficiently sophisticated task, anything, just take a, it's, it has to be sufficiently sophisticated, break it into tiny pieces, okay? And once you break it into tiny pieces, right, you could explain it in such a way that it sounds super complicated, and you could convince the other person that it's complicated, like the task. So, imagine, uh, you woke up today, and what did you do? You woke up, you went to the toilet, you washed your face. That sounds reasonable, right? But you could break it up into tiny, tiny pieces. No, no, I mean, let's not, I'm just going to stop at washing your face. After that, whatever you do, I don't care. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, you could explain it this way. First, you open your eyelids. And then you use your, mus your, your, your back muscles to support your torso upwards, right? And then you use your leg muscles to bring it out of the bed and put it onto the floor, right? And then continue to, leg to use your leg muscles. You lift your entire body upwards so that your spinal cord is in the upright position. And then you use your muscles in your leg to move it one leg forward. Then while keeping the pressure here, you lift the muscles to move these legs upward in this way. And then you repeat it, you repeat it like 20 times. Then you reach like this large rectangular wooden frame with a, met a metallic knob in the middle, and you twist it to the right so that the latch that's, that goes into the wall comes back out, and you push it open, right? And you open the door, and then you put your fingers onto the tab, and you spin it, and what happens is water comes out, which is supplied from the reservoir, and then you put it into your palms so that you know there's a bit of water here, and you splash it on your face. No, no, so think about it, right? I mean, I could just explain this as you compile Java and run it, done. But no, we had to say blah, blah, blah. So, so it's not complicated, it's easy, okay? We are supposed to be, not be afraid of complications. Hey, by the way, this lecture is webcast, right? Oh, crap, uh, Ben, don't fire me, I love you. <laughs> I'm so screwed. The next time somebody tells you something is complicated, challenge them. Okay, so let's continue. So, okay, so how does Java know what code in a class file to run? Well, there's this special method in a class known, the, known as the main method. Uh, it has these three modifiers. 
So public means that the, the method, uh, anybody can call the main method. Uh, static is a bit complicated. I'll see if I can explain later. Otherwise, uh, you don't really have to know. Just, just remember that it's there. And then it's white. It's white because the main method doesn't actually return anything. So when, when you run the class file, the Java virtual machine will look for this particular method and execute it. And you can also pass arguments into the main method. So uh, this allows you to modify how the program works based on the arguments given in. Uh, OK, so this is your speaker class. And now we've added a main method here. And uh, here we create a new speaker called Riz, who is not related to Rizlo. If you don't know who Rizlo is, search, search on Google. And this speaker said booms. Again, Ben wrote this slide, like, I, feel, I really feel sorry for Rizlo. Right? And, and, and strangely enough, when I saw the, the video and she said booms, I kind of understood what she meant. So that might say something about me, but Ben loves Rislow, I guess. So, so what happens is you create a new object Riz, and you do a new speaker. So this is a so you, you call the constructor here. Notice that here you did not define the constructor. You only had the same method. So what Java does is if you, have, if you don't define a constructor, it will do it itself automatically. So you created a new speaker, and you call the same method, and you pass in booms. So, so, so stuff here is booms, and it will print out to the screen booms. So that's the speaker. So you have lecture again. So that's another main method. So here you're creating the lecturer named Seth. Seth, uh, Seth is, uh, will probably teach you the next Java course. So Seth lectures Java is easy. So he's calling the lecture method here. And then you can also call the same method. So even though the same method was defined in speaker and not in lecturer, since you're extending, since lecturer extends speaker, you could just call that method directly. So let Seth dot say you have a quiz today, friend. Okay, and then finally we have the arrogant lecturer, who turns out to be someone named Ben. I'm not sure who he is. So there's this main method, arrogant lecturer Ben equals new arrogant lecturer. Ah, notice here that we are passing in a parameter to the constructor. So this was a constructor we defined earlier. We are passing in simple. So this dot favorite phrase equals simple. Okay. And then when Ben says, we have a request tomorrow, so you call the same method, then this will call the superclass same method and pass in the message, we have a request tomorrow, plus simple. So he keeps saying simple like an, so this really shouldn't be arrogant lecture, should be an annoying lecturer. <laughs> because for everything he says, he just says simple. So Ben lectures, scheme is cool. Simple, I, what kind of a statement is that? <laughs> Who speaks like that? But I'm going to get fired today, I tell you. So, so far, so good. Simple. <laughs> Annoying lecture. Annoying. OK, so this is how you declare methods. So you've seen all these classes, so, so we'll go into methods now. So the way you declare methods is you always put the access modifiers first, uh, public, static, or whatever. I mean, that's private, that's protected. I mean, I could go into excruciating detail about all of this, but we don't have time, and you're not interested in this. And for this class, I, a lot of it is irrelevant. So, well, you just try it on your own like, to, to find out what it means. So after the modifiers, you have the return type. So the main method here has no, has, does not return anything, so it's void. Then this is your method name. And finally, if your parameters. So, so you have static methods, and then, um, Okay, okay, certain methods, right, exist only after you create an object. So, like this lecturer, right, you created a lecture self. You can only call the lecture method on an instance of the object. So you have to do self.lecture. Or if you create another lecture call, let's say, uh, reslow, then reslow.lecture. And then, and, and so the method is always called on the, on the object. But static methods, they always exist. They are always there. You do not have to create a new instance. You could just do, for instance, uh, if let's say the same method here was static, you can just do arrogant lecturer dot c. So static methods mean it's always there. So that's why main is static. The main method is always there. Java can always ex uh, access the method. So there's this uh, modifier known as final also. So final means, so if I do a final method, right, like 
let's say my lecture, my, let's say the say method was final. Let's say this was final, public final void say. So what this means is, there is no subclass can ever override the method. You always have to, so the, so the code that say has will always be this. You can never, never override it. So this will be impossible if say was final. So final just means it's the final version of the method. You, you, you never, never override it. So, so this is how you declare methods. So now let's look at variables. So variables have a name and a type. We've repeated this enough times. So and variables are strongly typed, meaning if a method expects a string, you give it a string, not an integer. If a method expects an integer, you give it an integer, not a string. You cannot mix and match. If you want to convert from a string to an integer or, or, or YC or so or whatever, you have to do it explicitly. You cannot ask Java to do it itself automatically because Java is strongly typed and it's case sensitive. So this and this, even though they are using exactly the same letters, are different variables because this one you know, has a capital S and this is a small s and, well, V is different also. And there are two kinds of variables in Java. So the first ones are primitives. So primitives are, are variables that are very close to the machine. So like, okay, like this, like integer long uh, variables to keep track of integer. So the difference between these two is what's the, the range of values they can hold. So like, I don't think you can represent the number 7 billion in integer, but you could do it in long. So the reasons for that are, I, uh, I encourage you to go and find out what the ranges of integer and long are. Character only stores one byte, and then float and double uh, allows you to keep track of decimal numbers like uh, 1.23 or 3.57 or whatever. And again, the difference between float and double is like the difference between int and long. It's uh, how precise the number, I mean how precise double can be. So you could probably represent like 1.3333333332 in double and not float. And then finally you have the Boolean value, which is just true or false. So these are your primitive data types. Everything else is an object. Everything else, your speaker, your foot, uh, even your string. String is not a primitive data type, it's actually an object. And all objects in Java are extends the object class. So remember in your, your scheme OOP, you always had the named object as your base class. In Java, it's the object class. And finally, you have the null variable. So uh, remember that Seth, so earlier we did lecturer Seth equals to new lecturer. You could also do like lecturer Seth equals to null. So now, so when you do that, what you're saying is you're creating a, uh, a variable named Seth of type lecturer, and he currently is uninitialized. There is no value to Seth. So null value is just one that's been defined but hasn't been assigned a value. You assign a value later at some point. So conditionals. So if else statements, um, this should look very familiar to you. So if the, this, so you write a conditional uh, statement here. If this condition is true, you execute this. Else, if this condition is true, you execute this. Otherwise, you do this. Note that it, uh, your if condition need not follow this form exactly. Like if you don't need else if and else, you just stop at if blah, 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 stop. Or if you just need if and else if, you just if blah, blah, blah else if blah, 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 stop. Or you could just do if else. So it's kind of like what you do in scheme. You could just add more if conditions if you want or just use one, depending on how you need. And you have the switch statement. This is very, very similar to your scheme case statement. So you recall in recitation you had like case, message, and then depending on what message is, you, you do something. So similarly, you could do like switch message, then case, depending on what expression is, you execute some code. Uh, or if it's a, a, another, uh, or if expression is equal to something else, the second label, you execute some other code. Or if it doesn't match any of these, then you run the default clause. So there's this statement called break. Uh, we'll explain, uh, we'll look at break later. Like in like a few slides. Uh, just note that uh, switch expressions have a limitation. Like you cannot do string comparisons with switch. You can only do like integers and something else called uh, ordinals. But I mean not ordinals, uh, enums. But just uh, if you want to compare on strings, don't use uh, switch. Use use if. But if you are comparing on numbers, then you use switch. 
Okay. And then you have your assignment operators. Okay, so okay, here we are declaring a variable, integer x, and we assign the value 5 into x. So this is a very, very basic assignment operator. But you have some stuff that are slightly more advanced, like plus equals, minus equals, times equals, divide equals, modulo, and equals, and then more here. So this is just synthetic sugar. Like if you do variable operator equals b, it's the same as doing variable equals the variable op b. So like if you want to do, if you want to increment a by one, you could just do, you, you can do a equals to a plus one, or you can do a plus equals to one. So, uh, so a, th so this increments a by whatever number, this dec decrements it, multiplies it by whatever number, divides it. Uh, the rest you can go find out for yourself. Uh, I don't think beyond these four, you need the rest. Maybe you need this modulo operation, but you certainly wouldn't have to do, use this. This is, this. you can go find out or you could ask your tutors. Perhaps your tutors don't even know what this is. I mean, I admit I don't know what this is. I have to go find out what this is. I mean, I know this and this, but this kind of seems weird, but whatever. I don't know what this is. So you have your relational operators. Okay, so this is, again, very, very similar to scheme, greater than, greater equal, less, less than equal. Uh, the only thing that changes is how you use them. So uh, in scheme, you kind of did weird stuff, like you added like greater A, B, so to say that A is greater than B. But over here, you use the normal, everyday usage of the symbol. So A greater than B, the symbol comes in the middle. Then you have logical operators. Ah, okay, so okay, so you have an if condition here, and what we are doing is we want to check if n value is greater than 10, and the f value is less than 40, do whatever. So this is one condition, this is another condition. This operator says if both are true, run whatever code is, is, is listed here. This is an or, so if either this or this is true, run the condition. And finally, you have the not. Uh, what not does is it inverts the value. So if this condition is true, the addition of this will, will uh, negate, uh, I mean, in, invert the value. So if this is true, adding the not will change it to false. And if this is false, adding the not sign here will change it to true. I'm noting with the syntax error here, there's a bracket missing here, but I didn't do the slides. But that doesn't mean I won't make mistakes when I do the slides, uh, but I'm just trying to keep my job. <laughs> so writing, say, okay, so writing this is equivalent to this. If n is not greater, is, if n is not greater than 10, then it has to be less than or equal to 10. Oh, and then we have this. Okay, so uh, observation here is that in Java, a lot of times you write code like this. So if some condition is true, you set the result to this first value. Otherwise, you set result to a second value. So this appears often enough that the creators of Java added this synthetic sugar. So what you're doing here is result equals to then some condition question mark value one colon value two. So you read this in the same way you read this. If some condition is true, result is value one. Otherwise, it's value two. So it's just synthetic sugar. You could always write, this, write it this way if you don't remember this form. But this is just easy because it's also a one-liner. And finally, you have your type comparison operator called instance of. OK, so suppose you have a fruit class, and you have another apple class that extends from fruit. So by using the instance of operator, you can find out, you, you can know that, uh, I mean, you can confirm that an apple is an instance of a fruit. So that will return you true. And the reason you use instance of is because at some point, like uh, when you are working on a large project again, uh, sometimes you want to make sure that a particular object is of a certain type before you do certain operations on it. So use instance of. So in our example, uh, an apple is an instance of fruit. The question is, is fruit an instance of apple? The answer is no. Huh? If you don't remember, think about it this way. You resemble your parents. Your parents don't resemble you. Your parents gave birth to you, so you inherited your looks from them. But you didn't give birth to your parents. so their looks are theirs. You inherited them. So anyway, there's some code here you can just try at home. 
uh, use the speaker class and arrogant lecturer to find out how it does it. And now we come to loops. So to do iteration in scheme, you always used actually to do uh, iteration in scheme, you use recursion. But in Java, you use loops. So this is a while loop. So let's see what it does. So here you create an integer named value. You set it to zero. Then here you check. So here is the beginning of the loop. While the value, so while this condition is true, run this loop. I mean, run this code. So integer value equals zero. So value is zero. While zero is less than ten, which it is, you go down here, and then you run some code. And here you print out a line. So how many lines do you think is going to be printed? Ten, huh? So for those of you who read the answer immediately, uh, you might be confused by this. So this is another synthetic sugar. So if you want to increment a value by one, you can do a equals a plus equals to one, or you could just do a plus plus. Then there's also a minus minus to decrement it by one. So this just increments the value by one. And so zero, you go in, you increment it by one, it becomes one, and then you print out value is one. Then you go back here, so one is less than 10, you, then you increment it to two, you print out two, then you repeat it again and again. And eventually you'll have 10 different lines be, be printed. So then you have a do loop. So a do loop here, okay, so similarly, you, you know, you have a value here, you start it integer, you set it to zero. What do loop does is it runs the code first and then checks if the condition is true before running it again. So what happened in while loop was you check the condition first, run the code, and then check if the condition is true again before running it. But in do, you run the code first at least once and then check if the condition is true. And if it is, you go back inside and go on and on. So how many lines do you think is going to be printed now? Oh, all good answer is 10. Again, I expected like hesitations in the answer, but all of you are spot on, so good. Luck. So it's 10 lines, and the thing to keep note is that the block is evaluated at least once. And finally, your for loops. So uh, the difference between for loop is that you have the initial, the initialization phase, the condition, and the incrementing phase in all the same lines. So let's take a look at this. So here you're creating a variable, integer i. You set it to 0, OK? And here you have a condition that checks if i is less than 10. And here you increment i by 1. And this is how for loops work. You go into the for loop, you execute this once and only once at the start. Then you check if the condition is true. So if so, is i zero? Is i less than ten? Well, yes, it is. Then you execute this code. Question is, do you increment i after running the code or before? Okay. I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, they all spot on. I, I I was hoping one of you would say before. And I'll, I'll show how smart I am, but it turns out all of you are smarter than me. So it's after. So you will run this once and only once, check the condition, run this code, and then increment the value, check the condition again, then increment the value again and again. And eventually, you'll stop at some point. Well, we know how, you know the answer. OK, so we come to break. OK, I uh, recall the break statement earlier. So what break does is it will stop It'll, it'll stop the program execution and get out of a certain block of code. So over here, what you're doing is, okay, so i is less than, uh, i equals 0, less than 10, i plus plus. If i is equals to 5, okay, notice that I'm using double equals here and not a single equal. The reason is a single equal is an assignment operator. So it just sets i, equal, i to 5. But equal equal is a comparison operator. So it checks i, if i is 5, then it'll break. So what break does is when, when i is 5, it will stop, it will not execute this code. The program execution will just jump from here to here, to whatever code is here. So at, at 5, the loop just stops. So how many lines will be printed here? Ah, finally, <laughs> disagreement in the answers. Who said for? Ah, what do you think for? Ah, uh, now I can show how smart I am. I'm very happy. I can sleep today. And you know how I sleep? I put my legs, move, move my muscles, close my eyelids. 
complicated na, life. So, okay, so there's this other keyword called continue. So what continue does is, instead of breaking out of the loop, it just forwards the loop to the next instance. So when i is 5, it will say, okay, stop executing any more of the uh, loop, just go to the next one. So it will jump from continue directly into i++, so i will become 6, and then it will run the rest of the code. So continue just says, skip this step. Do not execute any more code in this, in this loop. Just go to the next one. So how many lines will be printed here? Ah, oh, crap. All of you know the answer. Ah, yes. Disagreement. Ah, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Okay, so nine, nine lines printed. Okay, so there's this, uh, another version of the for loop. This is, in some languages, is known as the for each loop. So what you do is, for each variable in an array, you do some stuff. So the question is, what's an array? Ah, uh, smart asses. No, and, oh no, I'm using a cursor, and this lecture is webcasted. I'm so... <laughs> okay, I can't use the word that comes to my mind. I am so dead, I guess. Okay, so what's an array? Like, kind of like a big list of things. A big what? Big list of things. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's something like that. So, uh, array really is a collection of elements. Okay, it could be of varying sizes, so you could create an array of, let's say, 10 elements, 20 elements. And you, using this loop, you could iterate through every object in that element. So it's like saying, for every paper in my file, for every paper in my scheme file, add it up, for instance. You do that only after the exams, not before. So, and, and this for each loop also works with uh, other collection types like lists and other collection objects. Uh, you will learn more about collection itself uh, in, the, in, in the next Java uh, module, not in this one. And what happens is the object, so each object in array is bound to the variable, and then you work on it. So again, array. So it's an index list of objects. So this is one way of declaring an array. There are many other ways. This is just one. So integer, the square brackets indicate that it's going to be an array. This is the name of the array. Equals. And here you're initializing the array with some values. And notice these are curly brackets, uh, not, the, the, not the normal parentheses and you are giving three values, one, two, and three. And they are indexed. So at index zero, you have value one. At index two, uh, at index one, you have value two. At index three, you have value, uh, at index two, you have value three. So zero, one, two. And the way to print them out would be my array, square brackets, and zero. So this line will print out one, this will print out two, and this will print out three. And if you try to do this, my array is three, you get an error. Because uh, the index only goes up to two. And okay, you can create other kinds of uh, arrays, like integer, integer array, float array, boolean array, and object. So when you create an array, there are some default values given to the elements. For integer, float, uh, it's zero and 0, 0, and then for boolean, it's false, and object arrays are all given the null values by default. So like you could create an array of speakers, an array of arrogant lecturers, and they all will be null. So each time you go to the index element, you have to create a new arrogant lecturer, a new speaker, and so on. So uh, these are arrays. So you, there are also some array functions. So you could get a length of an array, so how big an array is, using the dot length operator. So my array dot length here will give me three, because there are three elements. The indexes go to 0, 1, 2, but then there are three elements, so the length will be three. And so this is how you could iterate through an array. Count equals zero. So for each integer in my array, I will increment the count by one. So, so well, what is this? Well, this is what we've saw, seen earlier, the synthetic sugar to incrementing count by i. So what's the value of count? Ah, again, disagreement. I mean, what's the value of count? So what's the value of count at the end of the? Ah, six is the correct answer, because here you are incrementing not by one, but i. So i was one, two, three. So one plus two plus three, which if you didn't know was six, and if you didn't know that you're in deep trouble. 
So yeah, so uh, that's kind of it for the basics of Java. So what you have to do is you have to download and install Java from this website. Uh, I am not sure if this URL works. I, it should, but uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, Sun Microsystems used to develop Java, but it's but the company was bought over by Oracle. So Java belongs to Oracle now. So, but anyway, try this website. You might get there, and you have to download the Java SE Development Kit. SE stands for Standard Edition. Then you have to install it and figure out how to compile and run a Java program. That was the complicated set of instructions we saw earlier. And uh, you could also download and install Eclipse. Uh, I think you'll be using this for your DG. This is like a, the doctor racket for Java, but it's just one, and it allows you to create Java projects and uh, program easily and gives you a lot of uh, useful features. Uh, your tutor will probably go through it. Oh, Eclipse is not a compiler, it's like a development environment. Uh, if you want, there's others like there's NetBeans, and then I think there's something else. Uh, Yeah, yeah, they are, they are. Uh, try to, I think there's something called Dr. Java. I'm not kidding. The, I really think there's a Dr. Java. Doesn't work, uh. Did you, did you install Dr. Java after you installed the uh, JDK? Okay, so. So like, like he says, the JDK actually has a Java compiler built in. So what you do is you go to your command prompt and then you type Java C after installing the JDK. So like Java C space the name of the file that you want to compile. And then type Java, after you do Java C, do Java, then the, the name of the class, then you'll run that class. Get, get the Java as, okay, there's a classic one, what, what else is there? Yeah, yeah, Eclipse, yeah, that's a classic version, what else is there, that's like... Okay, just, just get the Java developers, don't get the EE. EE uh, is the Enterprise Edition, and it's full of crap that I don't even understand how, but it's like, I'm working on a project that does EE stuff, and I'm tearing my hair apart, so that's why I have to cut my hair. <laughs> Otherwise, it's too much of a pain to tear it out. So, just poke around with it. If you have a lot of questions, right, post in the forum, or bug your tutors. I mean, they bug me, uh, the Joe. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. I like Joe. If Joe, you're, if you are listening to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you've learned a new language in one hour. Uh, now you have to convince yourself that you can do what you did in Scheme in Java, which you can actually. You just need practice. And uh, for practice, what you have to do is you write factorial and exponential, both the recursive and iterative version. I just know that to do iteration in Java, you are using the loops you're not going to call your own method again and again. You did that in Scheme because Scheme is, everything is recursive in Scheme, even iteration, even though there's some optimizations going on. To do iteration in Java, you use the do loop, of while loop, or for loops. Right factor and exponential. So this is how your, this is the outline of the first Java program apparently. So this should compute Fibonacci. Uh, a, a nice thing to notice here would be static. Uh, beginners to Java usually use static as I did because it just lets you run the method easily instead of bothering about whether you have to create a new object or not. And then you have a program that calls FIP. So you yeah, just fill in the skeleton, you can discuss in the forum. Note that 30% of the final exam will be on Java. And don't quote me, okay, now I'm going to speak in my own capacity, not like, not, this is not something Ben asked me to say, but I think usually the Java questions is a giveaway. It's like a simple scheme question that is translated to Java. Do take a look at the previous year exams and you know that it's not that complicated, so you can work on it uh, quite easily. So 30% of your grade, so don't lose it. Uh, so end of slideshow, apparently. Click to exit. No, 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 I don't think you're going to get compiler error. But I've never seen one. It'll be, it'll, be, it'll be like, could a problem we've already seen in class in Java? Apply, yeah, apply. Apply what you've seen in, in, in Scheme in Java. So if there are any questions, you can come down and ask me, uh, or maybe go out, apparently. I think the next class is here. So that's the end of the class. <laughs>